Welcome, everybody, to the show. Tonight we have with us Paul Daniels, the designer of the upcoming game Bear Trap, which is now on P500 over at GMT. So go check that out. I have included a link to the uh, game's P500 page in the notes below. So thanks, Paul, for coming. No problem. Thanks for having me. Great, great to have you here. So let me let me start off by asking. I, I will for for those who haven't looked at it, the uh, Bear Trap is about the so the conflict between the Af- Afghans and the Soviet Union in the late seventies and and I guess early eighties. And and I'm old enough, like I'm sure many of the viewers here, to remember when this happened. But you know, I it is not something that I have studied much. Uh, or really read very much about since then. So we, I really only have, yeah, this happened. We boycotted the Olympics, and and I don't really know a whole lot about it. So let's start out by giving uh, giving us a, a, the nickel summary of the situation that the game simulates. Sure. So, um, yeah, the, towards the very end of um, 1979, the, the Soviets uh, really tried to install a puppet regime in Afghanistan and um, ended up having to go in in force uh, to prop up that that Marxist um, leaning government, uh, which you know the wider population within Afghanistan wasn't you know hugely enamored enamored with. Um, the Soviets ended up being engaged in Afghanistan for a lot longer than they they thought they would be. They kind of imagined they'd be in and out um, as, you know quickly. And it ended up being very nearly 10 years, I think just over nine years. So that, yeah, I guess that's the quick, quickest summary. Um, so what about the topic then make made it of interest to you of sufficient? Because this is, you know, designing a game is a project, right? So you were clearly interested enough in it to want to design a game on the topic. So what, what makes it that interesting to you? Sure. Good question. Yeah. So um I have always been kind of interested in the Cold War. Um, I think that that struggle is quite interesting, and the the Soviets as the the big bad enemy for so long, I think, is an interesting kind of historical struggle. Um, and the Soviet Afghan War is, I think, really the only time the Soviets their their modern military was was put to the test in a really significant longer term kind of way. Uh, and it, it didn't work out well for the Soviets in the end. Um, so I think the way in which that can, that modern army faltered in what you know might have been thought of as easy pickings, um, I think reveals it as some of the like an interesting kind of uh, a struggle. Um, yeah, so that kind of dynam- dynamic between the Soviet Union, um, the big empire, evil empire, and a, a much smaller less developed country uh, taking that kind of underdog role. Um, the contrast between the Soviet Afghan war and the uh, more recent war in Afghanistan, I think makes also makes it an uh, interesting conflict with the you know comparisons we can draw between those what happened then versus what happened more recently. That also makes it quite interesting, I think. So th- those are those are some of the reasons that it stood out to me. And the fact that there wasn't really a, um, you know, a popular mainstream game about the Soviet Afghan war is also something that made me think that this might be a fun thing to try and tackle in, in the design space. So a couple, couple points on that. There's obviously we, we drew parallels that, I mean, I remember this drawing parallels between the Soviet experience in Afghanistan and the ex- American experience in Vietnam. And then of course, obviously we've got the more recent American experience in Afghanistan. So we're not going to talk about that in depth. I'm just going to point out those parallels. Another interesting thing, though, as you allude to, is that uh, in the wargaming space, aside from the pretty small number of games about the Russian Civil War, there is like negligible games covering topics with the Soviet military in action outside of World War II. And as you say, they're really, you know, this was the big test and and it did not go as expected, right, As, as I think everybody else's experience in Afghanistan. It went. So what about, I, I see that you've chosen to kind of model the game based on some ideas that were previously seen in Sekigahara, which is another GMT product, very, very highly regarded game. Um, what made you turn to that system? I think, I think given my, you know, very cursory picture in my head about what a game about the Soviets in Afghanistan would look like, 
I think the obvious conclusion one would link leap to is you'd probably lean on the coin system quite a bit. So, so what made you choose? Was that something you considered, and or what uh, what led you to adapting the second Gahara system to this topic? Yeah. So the 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 kind of big aha moment for me in in this kind of part of the design process was you know I was thinking about the the Soviet Afghan War and um, one of the interesting aspects of it was the um, the level of defections, the, the the degree to which Soviets um, and especially their, you know, local allies in the Afghan army um, from their like puppet regime, the degree to which they defected um, and abandoned, uh, you know, the army and joined the Mujahideen insurgents. Um, I thought that that's a really interesting part of the war and the story here. And you know, I was playing Sekigahara uh, with a friend, and I had. The Soviet Afghan War and the, this design that I've been kind of thinking about in the back of my head, back of my mind, and the loyalty challenge system within Sekigahara is really what what popped out, um, and I thought that it could really capture the way in which these defections occurred and how they were impactful in the war in a really elegant kind of way. Um, so that was the, the really initial um, latching on point between the the core system from Sekigahara um, and how I thought a version of it could be adapted to um, simulate uh, the Soviet Afghan war. How challenging was it uh, to research this topic? Actually, I don't know how much literature is available in English on this. Did you, were you, did you have access to Russian sources, for example? I, I didn't No, um, it was just English sources. Um, yeah. So there's, I think there's a, you know, a solid, you know, five or six or so good books um, about the Soviet Afghan war from a mix of uh, his, like historians and a mix of journalists. Um, I also was able to find a number of scholarly articles um, online um, from more historical or political science scientists. Um, and I found those to be kind of helpful in the post-war analysis of what happened to the Soviets in the conflict. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about the game mechanics. So the game is a block game, and we'll show. Let me show the map off very briefly, and let me caveat this for those watching. This is not final art. This is placeholder art. So please do not get up in anybody's business about how the art looks bad. So this is the uh, the map out of the existing Vassal module. I assume you're using uh, the Vassal module for playtesting purposes. That's right. Yeah, we're using Vassal and Tabletop Simulator, um, as well as you know a few paper. Few people around the world have physical play test copies as well. So it's a block game. So explain then. I I I think I can imagine a scenario that would lead you to choose to use the block mechanic, and it is like the classic block mechanic, the hidden information block mechanic, which I'm probably gonna call the Tom Doglish mechanic from now on, just because Tom doesn't get enough credit for it. But um, what what led you down the path of using that me mechanism? Uh, well, I've always been a huge fan of it. I think it's a super elegant way to um, capture and simulate the, the fog of war um, in a number of different ways. Uh, and this is one way in which Bear Trap departs significantly from Sekigahara. Um, for those who, who are familiar with Sekigahara, it uses blocks in a, in a different way to the traditional block war game kind of way that, that Tom spearheaded. Um, uh, and so, yeah, in Bear Trap, um, I think it, it does a nice job of cap of simulating the uh, the fog of war and the uncertainty around um, unit strengths throughout the the country, especially when it comes to the insurgents. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the way that the the, the types of actions that are available to players inside the context of the game is there is there like a coin style action menu or a, or a more generalized rule system by which blocks can move and interact uh more the the generalized rule system so the the game is to a degree asymmetric um but it's not the case that each side has its own set of very distinct rules instead there's a common you know rule set and then there are exceptions that apply for the soviets for, and, and ones that apply for the uh, insurgents um so uh, what you'll do on your turn is one of three things. Um, you can, you'll have your hand of cards, and like Sekigahara, you can discard cards from your hand to activate areas and, and blocks in those areas, um, and that'll be the probably the most common kind of turn you'll take: um, activating blocks, moving them around, initiating combat. Um, 
The, well, the second kind of turn you might take is a strategy turn. So the, the game has these strategy cards um, and you can, they're, they're cards with power, powerful effects through which you play the card, it resolves its effect and then play passes to your opponent. Um, so an example of, of one of these um, strategy cards is the Soviets have a Soviet airstrikes card where they can, you know, effectively do an airstrike on um, a targeted area uh, and cause casualties to the insurgents in that area. Um, the third kind of turn you might have, or that, that you might take rather, is a resupply turn where you'll um, update the blocks of yours that are disordered. You'll make them mobilized. You'll replenish your hand of cards um, and do a couple other things. But in a quick overview, those are the three options you'll have in your turn, a, an area activation turn, a strategy turn, or a uh, resupply turn. Um, and w the way in which players do different things will vary based on the side they're playing. So the strategy cards each side has access to are very different. Um, the Soviets, for instance, have uh, access to armor units, um, which uh, can more easily overrun enemy blocks uh, and can move more, be, move more quickly. The insurgents have access to a, a greater number of blocks that can ambush um, the Soviets uh, as they are going to make progress around the country. So that's a quick overview. If that makes sense, happy to expand on any of that, though. So the strategy cards, as I recall from reading the uh, the GMT info page, are uh, add a a little bit of a deck building element too. Is what it sounds like, where you kind of have a menu of those cards off outside your hand, and at some point you're allowed to bring those into your deck. That's right. Yeah. So um, every time you reshuffle your deck of cards, you'll get to add up to two of these strategy cards to your deck. Um, the the starting deck size for each side, each player has their own unique deck of cards, and they start at I think thirty one and thirty three cards each. Um, so they'll grow by two cards each time you reshuffle. So it's it's a very light sprinkling of deck building. It's like I, I don't think it's accurate to call this a deck building game, um, but it. It's a way in which the game lets you define your overarching strategy over the course of the conflict. Um, if you want, as a Soviet, to lean more heavily into that air power, or if you know the insurgents want to lean more heavily on CIA intervention and other kinds of international aid. Yeah, this struck me as a way to bring in the clever part of a deck builder without having to bring in the tedious part of a deck builder. It's not a not a game style I'm particularly a fan of. Maybe I just haven't played any good ones, I'm, and I'm just unlucky. That's possible. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, this this is definitely not a deck building game. It's like you're you're adding two two cards um, each time you reshuffle. So let's uh, let me ask about the the way the combat works. How is it? Is it like a dice pool system? Is it a CRT? Because that's something I did not glean from from reading about the game. Yeah, so the game has no dice um, and no uh, tables to, to to analyze throughout the game. So what will happen is when combat resolves, as you resolve combat, players will, will play cards from their hand to commit matching blocks to the battle. So, for instance, the, the Soviets, if they have like an, an inf infantry block in the combat area that they want to commit, They'll play a infantry a matching infantry card from their hand to commit it, adding the impact value of that block to their their total for that that battle. Um, and whoever has the lower total of impact will hold the initiative, um, and they'll hold it until they they tie or, or pass the initiative. Um, in most cases, you can only commit blocks that are in the combat area, but um, Blocks that have an orientation towards the ambush are poised to, to ambush their enemies. And so, you know, they can, in, in that case, be committed to a battle from an adjacent area, um, which, which kind of makes it harder to analyze the relative strength of your opponents going in if, if you're worried they might, you know, have created a trap, um, which is something the insurgents here are um, really well disposed to to do is so like one of their strengths um and through the combat system here um we are able to simulate the insurgency and counterinsurgency 
insurgency elements of the war, I think, really well in a really interesting way. Um, the insurgents will lose ties, um, right? So if you know both sides have an impact total of three, the insurgents will hold the initiative still, um, but they can choose to pass at that stage. They'll lose the battle, um, but they won't take any casualties, right? Because the number of casualties you'll take is going to equal the difference in impact total, right? So if it was five versus three, the loser would have to take two casualties. But if it's both tied, no casualties have to be taken. The insurgents would lose because it's a tie, but they'd have to be have to retreat. Um, so through clever play, the insurgents can see that they you know aren't going to win this battle, play to for a neutral result, and then end up dispersing into the countryside. Um, and, so, and it becomes hard for the Soviets to to stamp them out because they just scatter into the wind. So let, let me ask, I'll, I'll ask about the Soviets too in a minute, but since you just mentioned the insurgents, let's let's take a take a seat in their chair for a moment and talk about what the play experience for the player um, in playing the insurgents looks like. What kinds of decisions does that player have to make? What does the landscape look like? What kind of tools do they have available that may or may not be the same type of tools that are available to the Soviet player? So the insurgents uh, really want to um, lay traps for the Soviets, right? They want to um, become a roadblock that the Soviets have to deal with. And when they try and deal with that roadblock, they end up finding themselves in a more difficult position than one they can deal with adequately. So the, the insurgent forces are, uh, are, are weaker than the Soviets, especially in the early game. So in the early game, they predominantly have access to local untrained tribal fighters, um, unskilled rebels. Um, and these forces are easily replenished, right? And, and so it kind of simulates the way in which Soviet atrocities can motivate others around the country, others to take up arms against these invaders. Um, over the course of the game, though, the insurgents gain access to more skilled Mujahideen fighters. Um, who are, you know, better, um, and by better, I mean, have higher impact values um, on their blocks. Um, what the Soviets can do, or sorry, rather, what, what the insurgents can do um, is through victories in battle. So if they, well, they'll lose most battles that they end up fighting. If they are able to win choice battles, they'll gain access to particularly good blocks, captured artillery blocks, which simulate the, the captured resources that the insurgents took on the battlefield, and then use those to take a more aggressive posture as the war goes on. Um, so, you know, the, I guess the, the play experience for the insurgents is really one of the underdog that, you know, you, you're going to have to be the thorn in the Soviet side, try and per prevent them from reaching their victory condition while you try and get towards your own. And what you're trying to do as the insurgents is one of two things. Uh, if you capture Kabul, the capital, at any point, you win. Um, failing that, if you can gain nine Soviet fatigue points over the course of the game, you'll win. Um, you predominantly get Soviet fatigue by eliminating Soviet infantry and Soviet armor blocks by having those casualties on the Soviets, not on their local allies, the Afghan army, but on the Soviets themselves. And so what the Soviet fatigue is trying to simulate is the limitations that the Soviets as a government and as a, a populace are willing to endure in pursuit of this conflict. Right? How many upset mothers, upset families, um, and embarrassments on the world stage are the Soviets willing to tolerate? So that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to find in the mix where the Soviets themselves are and put the, the pressure on those blocks, those forces. And then from the Soviet standpoint, uh, what, what kinds of, uh, of gameplay angles can, can a Soviet player pursue? Um, so the Soviets are trying to do one or two things. they got two victory conditions. Uh, so if they can ever clear Afghanistan, all Afghan areas of insurgent blocks, they can declare victory. Um, failing that, 
uh, if they can, over the course of the game, accumulate nine Soviet control points, they'll win. The way that they do this is by controlling the three cities on the map, Herat, Kandahar, and Kabul, um, and being able to trace a route from each of those cities back to the Soviet Union along the highway areas, the kind of the, the dark... Which, which we can see on the map. Yeah. Because um, what the... Right, the, that's the, 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 the really focal part of the country, the, the ring road around Afghanistan and those main cities. So what the Soviets trying to do is maintain control of these cities and maintain control a, a, a linkage between them back to the Soviet Union. Right? It's a way to kind of say, we control the bulk of the country. We effectively control it, even if pockets remain rebel held. Um, and you check for this Soviet control when a player has to reshuffle their deck. Um, so when, that, when a player has to reshuffle their deck, it triggers the the Geneva talks process, um, which is a number of steps that the player goes through. And one of them is checking to see whether the Soviets um, satisfy this condition. Um, that's, yeah, the, the main way in which they'll derive Soviet control. And so in pursuit of that, the Soviets, you know, are focused on protecting their Soviet forces. Um, they protect, they're, they're trying to use their local, um, Afghan allies as the tip of the spear, mindful that they might defect, um, which can turn the tide in a battle. Um, and they're trying to, to do this without becoming overstretched. So they've got access to better units um, through their Soviet infantry, through their Spetsnaz, through their armor. Um, they've got access to uh, air superiority through um, an air bridge between um, the USSR and a Kabul, and they're able to airlift uh, blocks around the map. Um, so they've got a degree of greater mobility, um, but they have the risk of becoming overstretched. So let me uh, let me ask: Is uh, how, so there was you know we, you know peasants like me will recall right that there was significant foreign aid provided to the Mujahideen and other uh, resistance groups within Afghanistan. If they're I don't know how significant that was. Uh, in, in what way does the game model that? I mean, it seems obvious that you could just like say, here's a card that says, you know, America, you know, foreign aid from somewhere. Uh, how, how does the game, how does the game model that uh, assistance in fighting the Soviets from outside Afghanistan? Yeah, so there's a couple ways. Um, the areas that are Pakistan, the two Pakistan areas and Iran, um, what the, the insurgents can do is muster those you know, better Mujahideen units through Pakistani training camps, Iranian training camps in these adjacent areas, and then try and cross the border effectively to apply pressure in, you know, vulnerable areas within Afghanistan. Um, the, the insurgents do have access to CIA intervention, um, which is a way in which they can try and uh, neutralize the Soviet air superiority. Um, that is simulated through card play. Um, and from aid within the country, there's um, war insurgent tribal warlords and warlord strongholds, um, uh, which is one avenue in which the insurgents can gain access to <clears throat> better uh, blocks um, without having to bring them in from, a, a, from Iran or Afghanistan directly. They're kind of simulated as being smuggled in um, more covertly. So I think I think that's probably all the questions I have about the mechanics and about how the game works, at least for now. Uh, so let me get get try and uh, try and get you to give me a little kind of peek inside the process of of designing something like this for GMT specifically, and and how that works. Is this like you had this idea and you pitched it to GMT, and they said, "Sure, let's let's put it on P five hundred and see what happens." Is, how does that even work? Uh, I, I, I can give you the, the backstory on the game design. So I, I first really started thinking about um, designing a game about the Soviet-Afghan war. Uh, I think it was around 2015. Um, at the time, I was lecturing in Australia um, and teaching a course on military ethics. Uh, and I touched on the Soviet-Afghan war in, in that course. And um, that kind of really got me thinking more about it. I was playing a lot of games at the time and thinking about game design. So that's 
that's when I, the, the seeds first got planted. Uh, it wasn't until around 2017 um, that the ideas for what would become bear trap really solidified and I kind of latched onto the core system that is in Sekigahara, something that might be adaptable to accurately simulate this conflict as well. Um, so by late 2017, I designed the game and started playtesting it with friends in, in, in town. Um, got it to a point where it worked, it was fun, um, it was playable in the, the time that I wanted it to be playable. It was, it was kind of ticking all the boxes. Uh, and then I reached out to, to GMT, um, chatted with them by, by email, had back and forth, sent them a physical copy of the game. Um, Andy Lewis at GMT, I think, played it. We had some discussions by email, um, he had some great feedback. And then, uh, yeah, kind of went from there, got picked up by, P5, by, the, by GMT, went on the P500. And I started working with uh, Joe, one of their developers, um, and we mustered a wider group of playtesters um, who have been doing a lot of playtesting online, as we mentioned earlier, by Vassal or Tabletop Simulator. And the game is effectively the design of the game. I think when I first reached out to GMT, the design of the game is about 90, 95%, I mean 95% finished. Um, and now it's, I think safe to say that it's done. Um, the only changes that I think might come out still will be ones based on playtest feedback. If somebody manages to, to break the game, playtest play testing will continue until it goes to, to the printer, right? Uh, just to, to make sure. No reason important. not to. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Why stop? Yeah. That might you never know when you might find that one typo in the rule book that breaks the whole game. That's right. So that that that's the, a quick summary of the journey that Bear Trap has gone on. Yeah, so I was I was going to say it sounds like it's it was in a pretty high state of completion before GMT even heard about it. So yeah, very much so. I like I you know written a complete rule book. Um, yeah, like all the the assets, you know, the playtest art that I'd done myself, including the map design, um, was was done. It was a, a fully functional game. I do want to ask about the solitaire system because I know that there is a, an included built-in solitaire system. So tell us a little bit how that works. Yeah, so this it wasn't something that I had originally come up with when I first reached out to GMT. Uh, the solitaire system, I think, is really a consequence of the pandemic. Um, you know, I wasn't able to game really like like everybody else, uh, and so I, I thought, you know, why don't I use this time and really get into solitaire gaming because I haven't really been much of a solo gamer gamer myself. And so I did, and I started thinking about how we might be able to use a system, a solitaire system for a bear trap. And so one of the things I did when I had lots of downtime during the pandemic and lockdown was try and develop a system for bear trap. Um, what I came up with uh, is a system that I think works really well for this particular game. So it uses a deck of cards, um, I think 13 cards. Uh, what will happen is you'll, whenever you need your opponent, you know, the, the bot to, to decide on some course of action, you'll flip a card and then from this little this small deck, consult the relevant part of it. Um, and that'll, that coupled with three flow charts will dictate the, the bot's behavior in the game. Um, so the, the solitaire uh, mode for Bear Trap is really inspired by Labyrinth, the War and Terror, uh, which uses a flow chart system as well, um, and Combat Commander. Um, so if, if for, the, for those who are familiar with Combat Commander, it's got those multi-use cards, right? So you'll flip a card and it'll give you dice results or a hex to consider or an event or actions or you know, a variety of different things. That's kind of how this deck of 13 cards works as well. So it's got a number of very different attributes um, and you'll flip the card and based on what question you have, you'll consult the different parts of the card. The, the fact that it's 13 cards, there's only 13 cards, was one way I wanted to make it more reliable and not uh, like incredibly swingy um, for having, you know, dice rolls or a, a bigger deck of cards, right? So it's, it's a small deck, 
and you'll work your way through it until there's a single card left in the, in the draw deck. You won't play that last card. That's when you'll reshuffle the deck. Um, so that's a, that's a quick overview of it. It's of everything with the design. It's the thing that's really still getting tinkered with. Um, so in October of this year, I'm going to the GMT's weekend in the warehouse and I'm meeting with Jason Carr to, to talk about it. Um, and he does a lot of work with the GMT one group. Um, and, and they're going to, as soon as they get some capacity, dive deep into this solo mode for bear trap and, and try and make sure it's as strong as can be. Can, uh, can you use the bot to play either the Soviets or the, uh, the insurgents? Uh, when I first developed it for the, uh, well, during the pandemic, um, you could only use it to play like where the, the bot would play as the Soviets and you would have to play as the insurgents. Um, but Joe, the, my developer has, has been keen on adapting it so you could play either side. Okay. So it's a, it's a full solitaire system That's right. that will allow you to play either, you know, whatever side you find interesting at that particular moment. I think uh, I like that a lot better than say, cause I, I think the uh, there's at least a couple examples I can think of where it's 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 there's a solid it's a two player game with a solitaire system, but, but the bot only runs one faction. Um, yeah. And actually, I think what wasn't one of the or a couple or the early coin games were like that too. Uh, I think that's uh, that series has gone away. The, the the mechanism you just described actually kind of reminds me of the the solitaire system in Gandhi. Uh, sure. But it sounds now that you've explained it, it sounds a little bit more inspired by Combat Commander and how how that uh, that just that card mechanism works, which is a, a very clever part of Combat Commander. Yeah. All right. So, Paul, I would like to thank you very much for uh, for sitting down with us to talk about Bear Trap. Everybody, go check out the uh, the P five hundred or pre order page and get on that if this is something that interests you. That link is in the video description. So again, Paul, thanks so much for uh, for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for your time. Uh, I appreciate the interest in Bear Trap. And thanks, everybody, for watching. Have a great night.